All right. Well, uh, good morning or good evening, everyone. Since people are joining in from different time zones, thanks for joining in. Uh, today, we have Dr. Joao Vesosi from Duke University uh, joining us to talk on public health data science. Uh, for policy making in low and middle income countries. Uh, Joao is also my mentor, uh, and he was my advisor for my master's thesis. Uh, he's a co leader of a research group within Duke Global Health Institute called Global Emergency Medicine Innovation and Implementation Science Research Lab. Uh, he's an assistant professor in surgery, global health, and neurosurgery at. Duke University School of Medicine. And he is also an adjunct professor at University of Maringa in Brazil, where he is advisor to a lot of graduate students there. Uh, his, his area of focus is healthcare access, emergency medicine, surgery, but also injuries due to alcohol use. Uh, and he works in Brazil and Tanzania. Uh, and hopefully now expanding to India, at least for surgical care. Uh, I also work with him for alcohol use phenotyping, which is a small project that he guided me to develop last year. And uh, I think today he is going to give like a summary of all his previous work, but also, uh, also what's coming new. Uh, in the lab and also in the field. So, with with that introduction, I think sure you can you can get started. Thanks for joining us today. Sure. No, thank you, Sid, for the introduction and very kind words. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the time and the invitation. It's great to be able to talk to uh, a different audience than the ones that I'm used to uh, in Brazil. So I'm very glad for the opportunity, and I hope you can enjoy what I've uh, put up here to discuss. Uh, my goal uh, today was to mostly talk through the work that we've done and discussing the possibilities of using data science from this public health perspective in a way to bridge the gap for access to care and to strengthen the health system, especially in areas with low resources. Um, so a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about enrolls this space. What I'm presenting is definitely not uh, comprehensive of all the work that we are doing in our group, but it's a couple of examples to fit within the time that we've agreed for this presentation uh, to be able to kind of cover different topics and different approaches. So I do hope you enjoy and uh, I'm happy to take questions and talk, keep, keep talking about this afterwards. So let me start presenting. Yep, and we'll go from there. So, yeah, so like Sid uh, introduced me already, uh, and I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about myself in the beginning here, just to give you some context. So I'm talking to you uh, here from Durham, the United States, where Sid and I work together here at Duke, and this is Duke. It's a very beautiful university, a very beautiful campus. Glad to have anybody uh, interested come and visit us and meet the campus and meet the group. You're always welcome. Um, and oops, I am originally from Brazil, as you can see from the photo on the right of the screen, the very uh, traditional landmark of the country. So I apologize for any uh, errors in my English speaking, as English is not my primary language. And this to the left, it's a picture of my son uh, who might be joining us at some point during the presentation, it's something that I can't control. So if he does, he's just gonna say hello and he will go away. But as you can see, that's not gonna be a surprise. So here at Duke, I work at the Duke Global Health Institute. That's where I work with Sid uh, and we're continue to develop our research here. Uh, but my primary appointment is in the School of Medicine in the Department of Surgery in the Division of Emergency Medicine, where my goal is to be a PhD scientist in the division 
and help foster the clinical research on acute care globally and locally. So I've been engaged in many types of different research, always with the focus of strengthening the methodological approach and later on strengthening the data science approach of these research projects. So the context of projects that I work varies a lot given the type of interest of the division itself, uh, but I'm very interested on this ability to uh, bridge this gap of access to care in resourced, in low resourced areas using data, available data, and the powers of data science and technology. So in the past years, I've designed these three initiatives, uh, most of them with collaborators in Brazil, uh, and some more that are coming on. Uh, but basically, I lead the Gemini group with Dr. Catherine Staten, one of our uh, clinical faculty here at the Emergency Medicine Division. And it's a group dedicated to uh, emergency medicine, innovation and implementation and mostly with a global health focus. So it's a, an umbrella group that brings together people interested in working with acute care and how we can use innovation and implementation science to develop, uh, uh, to uh, build capacity and provide research evidence in low resource scenarios. The second group, the GETS, we call it GETS uh, in Portuguese, it's a group focused on uh, geoprocessing and technology for health. Uh, the acronym is in Portuguese, but basically it's a group dedicated to developing and applying geoprocessing and technology to data and data science, trying to, incre to increment healthcare solutions. And then finally, the MATH consortium is a consortium of researchers that uh, work together to identify grant and leverage projects in the area of methods, analytics, and technologies also for healthcare. So these innovation, these three uh, initiatives are things that I've been spearheading in the past years. And now we're kind of collating this together into a new center for implementation of data science that we're about to launch at DGHI as well. That kind of encompasses the same um, as spectrum. So then within these groups, the, most of my attention has been dedicated to this area of global emergency medicine from various perspectives, uh, focusing on things such as humanitarian assistance, public health, disaster relief, pre-hospital care systems development, acute health needs in resource limited settings, uh, residency and education focus, and also clinical research to improve uh, care. So it really spans across different fields of applied science that are different from a more generational science, like developing new molecules or new uh, uh, treatments. It's more of this uh, uh, interface between having the evidence, having the data, and leveraging this data to something that can be implemented or applied in healthcare or public policy. And so within this space, uh, I've worked in many locations globally, and this is always an expanding piece, as you're not going to note that there's a missing India here on this map, which is something that Sid and I have been working on improving. And this is also an opportunity to bring that uh, one step uh, further. Uh, but basically, it's focused on the uh, low and middle income world which I don't have any uh, uh, reservations to say because I am from a low and middle income country as well. And I do understand a lot of the uh, issues that we face in developing health systems and providing care for all. At the same time, I've experienced the innovation that these countries uh, implement in order to reach these goals in the absence of more uh, structure or resources uh, from the high income world. So I think it's a fascinating field. And I think that the uh, creativity that we end up developing and the flexibility we end up developing to address the issues we face uh, that are drastic are something that motivates me a lot to continue in this space. The way that we organize our work 
is that we focus on acute events from the entire healthcare continuum perspective. So this is just a figure that we use to depict the kind of work that we do and how it's distributed across the continuum of care, all the way from surveillance to rehabilitation. So we have studies around surveillance of diseases, prevention of diseases, on pre-hospital care, hospital-based care, and rehabilitation. Obviously, this is one way to operationalize how healthcare is distributed. There's different ways. We like to use this one because it's centered on the acute event. So you have the pre-acute phase all the way through pre-hospital care and the post-acute phase on hospital care and rehabilitation. And then we do work in all of these spaces trying to address acute events such as coronary syndrome uh, events, injury, um, and a lot of other pieces. So yeah, it, it really spans across a lot of different fields. But then I dedicate myself to data science. And um, I kind of started using the word data science because it became a buzzword and it's easy for people to kind of put you in the box of what data science mean. But I, I like to think more on a frame of a methodologist or somebody in the space of understanding things from the structural perspective. And I think data science is limiting on that, ex on that extent because it's not only data science from this broad definition that we use, but it's become one of the biggest things, mostly because of the way our computer science world is developing and our uh, ability to access existing data is also increasing our capacity to do methodology based on data. And I think data science is a great way to be in that space. So why data science? Well, I like to play around with these uh, images uh, from a TV show that I really love called uh, Black Mirror uh, to play around with the concept that we are in this interface with technology and all the ways from our robotics to virtual reality to the ability to expand and experiences using technology. These, all of these things feel like they are somewhat magical kind of like this light, lightning bolt here. But in fact, this is all data being put to good use. And all of these images here feel like they are part of a dystopian technological world out there, but they are all actually happening in practice. So the ability to use robotics is something we've experienced on a daily basis. And you can transform robotics into this cool little robot animal running around, or you can just understand that from the artificial intelligence perspective and apply that to having instances that are intelligent enough to help us understand data without necessarily having a human to tell uh, or to interpret the information. That is a reality, right? Uh, at the same time, that virtual reality, as we can see here on the right, feels something from the game world, but it is being used and it can be used. For instance, there's a preeminent researcher here at Duke called Miguel Nicolelis, who's been doing a lot of work on uh, neuroscience. And he's used virtual reality with a colleague of mine here who runs a lab on this space to develop uh, virtual uh, self images that people that are disabled from the bottom to the left that can have no use of their legs could experience the sensation of the legs on the virtual reality. And with that, they started regaining some sensation in a very specific case of injury where there's still a connection in the ligaments and all of that, but triggered by the power of our ability to symbolize ourselves in the virtual space. So that's kind of really cool high tech stuff, yes. But what the way that we've been using virtual reality is to use virtual reality to do task sharing or task shifting tasks so that in a low resource space where you have a surgeon without the, exp the expertise or the knowledge to conduct neurosurgery, for instance, or to conduct a very specific type of surgical procedure, we can create a virtual environment that a somebody with a neurosurgery training in some other country could join the surgical theater in real time 
and experience the surgical procedure from the eyes of the surger, surgeon and provide feedback and provide orientation in real time. So that's a different way of using virtual reality, but it's already in practice, right? Or just bringing it up to the context of augmented reality where you can use augmented reality glasses to see organs in coming out of the patient so you can understand them from the volumetric perspective, from the dispositional perspective and improving our experience. This is a couple of steps away from implementation because we still have to trigger some issues with the bulk of the technology. Those glasses are big, big glasses. It takes away, are heavy for you to stay hours during surgery. Uh, there's connectivity issues to address, but all of this come in a perspective that this is going to be reality in a couple of years and not just something that we're talking about in uh, movies. While the whole concept of experimenting or increasing our experience through technology, uh, I like to bring the concept of extended cognition and how we can use artificial intelligence in a way to extend our ability to think and our ability to process things. So all of this is really cool, as in this movie here on the Black Mirror episode, that you use this little device to throw yourself into a different space and it triggers all your memories. It's really cool. I love this show. But we can translate this to something more pragmatic and more real, where we implement an artificial intelligence in the primary care setting that receives a pregnant woman, receives data that a layperson or somebody with some training could collect. And that intelligence can help us understand potential delivery dates, risk for bad outcomes, risk for mortality, such as mortality, prematurity, neonatal deaths. And that can help organize the health system and provide specialized care for people that are in a higher risk uh, pattern. So this is, this is actually a way to expand our ability to interpret data without necessarily have to somebody look at the data in real time. So that's why I'm fascinated by technology and data science. Uh, and I see that there's a question here in chat from Kieran. Uh, can we use data science for solving mental health related issues? If, if yes, it would be very nice if we could give us a bit of insight into how it can be done. Cool, yes, I don't have a mental health example on the presentation, but I'll be glad to talk about it as there's been a couple of uses for it. One of them, you could ask Sid and he can tell you all about how we are trying to gamify uh, alcohol use disorder uh, evaluation using behavioral tasks. So instead of asking somebody about their alcohol use, what you do is you give them a bunch of tasks to perform, such as playing a little game, or choosing images out of an image stock. And from that activity, you can infer what their level of alcohol use is. And therefore you can even interpret what kind of triggers are triggers for alcohol use disorder in that specific person. And then you can use tailored intervention to try to address that issue with that population. That's one example. I'll talk a little bit more about Another example use, using natural language processing, that that's something that I've been working on and I find it fascinating that you can use uh, people's uh, internet usage, such as tweets, Facebook, or any kind of social network usage uh, to using natural language processing or image recognition to understand risk profiles for mental health disorders and engage them to healthcare uh, in a more, uh, passive way than if you would necessarily have to have somebody investigating them. Some people here at Duke are using uh, robots to, to build uh, chatbots that are supposed to provide you some basic mental counseling. So you can come to this chatbot and make your complaint and you're gonna receive some information about uh, potential treatments and things that you can do. And those are a little bit of what data science can do. Um, but yes, we can definitely approach this from the virtual reality space, from the artificial intelligence space, from a different a myriad of things. What you, can, what you need to think about is what is currently being done for mental health processes that are data-driven. If there's something that's data-driven, we can definitely automate that through data science. And that's on an individual perspective. There's other applications of data science that I'm going to show you 
that I, I'm more interested in that involves a policy perspective that goes a little bit further from that, that could be applied to mental health as well. So yes, please keep questions coming as much as you can. So uh, for those that are not uh, versed on the topic, data science is basically this space. It's not an area of science. It's not a, uh, something that originated from philosophy of science or anything. It's basically a space where people started working in the area and then it became an umbrella word for this space. I remember about this a lot because I started training in this area where data science was not a word and it became a word further on. And so it was easy to just uh, integrate that identity to ourselves, but it was not something at the time. But data science, it's called this space where there's an inter intersection between somebody with a computer science knowledge or an IT knowledge, so he knows how to program, somebody with math and statistics knowledge, so understands things from a methodological perspective, and the domain analysis or domain knowledge. So a data scientist could be a clinician that trained on computer science and knows about statistics. It could be a statistician that got versed on computer science, so knows how to program beyond doing data analysis, understands building databases, understands interfacing with web, web uh, applications and all of that, and spends time dedicating to understand a domain or works within a domain for long enough to be able to answer questions independently. Or it could be a computer scientist that understands more about math than just to understand computer algorithms, understands how to do hypothesis testing, understands how to build linear models to build uh, intelligences and spend time understanding the domain. This is important because what we see currently, we still see this currently, is that there's a lot of people with a lot of clinical domain knowledge. So clinicians that understand a lot about their field, but don't understand enough of the other areas to be able to propose solutions in this space. There are statisticians that understand enough and a lot about statistics, but can't get away from uh, modeling databases or understanding the needs that are specific from the IT and don't understand the domain enough to be able to work with clinicians or theoretical researchers and suggest solutions based on data science. And so this interface is from people that come from one of these spaces and integrate the field. Uh, and are able to provide solutions from that area, from that standpoint. And there's a myriad, because, because data science is not a very well-established field, is a field that came out organically out of the need and out of the way that the world was developing. Data science doesn't have necessarily one big framework. I like this notion here that kind of understands data science as interpreting and understanding data from the perspective of how to collect or generate or store data, how to transform data, how to model data, visualize data and deploy data. And I like this concept because this is what I understand as the data life cycle. And you really get the cycle of data from all the way of data being generated to data being deployed somewhere. So it, the data stops being this um, uh, entity and starts to become something that provides meaningful value to society uh, as it was developed to do. And, and there's a myriad of potential softwares or applications you can verse yourself to use to work in the space of data science. So following this spectrum, data is the center of our whole concept. Data science has data on its core. Um, sure. I can tell you which model of NLP. Yes, when I get to the NLP portion, I'll talk a little bit about that. Yes, thank you. So data is in the center of this space. And what I like to call the data cycle is this cycle that starts from data creation, goes all the way from processing data, analyzing data, preserving data, accessing data, and reusing data. And, this, and then it starts again with new data entering this cycle, and it keeps going on and on and on. And this is a very important cycle to think about because most research groups, most research projects stop on the data creation phase all the way to data analysis. So you collect data, you process data, you analyze data, and then you publish your papers, and then the data is never used again. 
or when you are in uh, electronic health records or uh, data from uh, governments or even companies, you create data, you process data, you analyze data, and you feed your decisions out of it, and it's never done again. So the steps that I think are important to think about is how you preserve that data, how you make that data accessible, and how you make that data reusable. So now data that it's something that is from society it starts to provide information back to society because it's been reused for things outside of the original scope. And it's a living thing. It's a living entity. The data never loses its, in, its importance. If it's outdated, outdated data, it tells historical uh, lines, histories. If it's new data and it's built to answer a clinical question, it could also be used to answer different questions as well. So then the data life cycle is something a data scientist needs to understand. And understanding data life cycles and building data structures help with science reproducibility, help with data productivity, help with capacity building, and help with this ethical component that I find very interesting, which is the data is developed to society and it should bring back information and value to society and not to uh, whoever owns that piece of information. In, uh, so that's the first step. And a couple of examples of data, and this is all in Portuguese because it's from the Brazilian health system, but I would invite you to read about this, is the Brazilian health system has a very unique data infrastructure. And I know that the work, by working with SID, India has very interesting systems-based data as well. But the SUS is the Brazilian health system. It's the unique health system. It has a unique data infrastructure that is fully open, fully accessible, and collects data from every single patient interaction in the health system in all of the health. You can explore this data and come up with rationale, models, and innovation to improve healthcare access and healthcare uh, uh, distribution or equity in the country, which is a very good model of uh, a data cycle that I really like. Uh, and another buzzword that's important to understand for those of you that are involved on developing data or working with data is the FAIR principles, so that whenever you're developing a database, you follow a group of principles that are going to dictate how the database is developed in a way that it's going to be already in the new frameworks we expect people to follow, making data F for findable, a for accessible, I for interoperable, and R for reusable. So therefore, a data set is not created as something that stands alone for answering a research question. The data set you've created now becomes this living entity that can be reused in other research to develop other kinds of innovation and provide more information to society as well. So this is the fair. I invite everybody to come and uh, learn more about this as we build new databases. We are in the process of implementing this as our stand practice to how we generate data in our group. It takes a little bit of work and it takes a little bit of involvement. I'll show you an example. This is what we're calling now the GRID. So the GRID is, stands for a Global Repository for Injury Data. And this is one of the projects that we are doing now that involves studying and developing databases. It's less about a clinical output and more about creating an infrastructure for data that is going to be the base ground for multiple other projects or multiple other innovation that are gonna come out of it. The grid is an injury database repository. And our goal is to come up with a low and middle income country specific repository of injury data that is standardized following the FAIR principles from different countries and different sites so that we can congregate the power of data that has information about different kinds of healthcare systems. The problem, the gap that we're trying to uh, fill with the grid is that most clinical practice guidelines, most innovations, most uh, uh, 
clinical referral uh, uh, equations are all created in high income countries because they have data available because these countries have uh, uh, infrastructures to generate data that can be reusable. The problem is that all of us use these guides in our countries and we end up understanding that these guides that come from high income world doesn't necessarily translate well to the disparities that we face in the low and middle income world. And so what we want to do here is to combine, standardize, uh, look at the quality of data from multiple low income, middle income countries and using that to generate innovation and compare that to the innovation created in high income countries to see if it would be better to predict, to uh, provide clinical meaningful information and to provide uh, better ways to do clinical and policy work in the low resourced world. We believe that by using data from the low and middle income country, that data will provide us information that will encompass the information of healthcare gaps, of difficulties in accessing care, problems with lack of infrastructure that are very common in these scenarios. So what we are doing here, and this figure kind of is our initial framework for the project, is getting data from different countries. These were the countries that we had in the initial phase of the grid. All of this data funnels through our database development algorithm that's been developed, that standardizes, aggregates, and documents this data. Then it goes through a pipeline that initially we were gonna build a big warehouse kind of like a warehouse for uh, storing things, but virtually we were gonna put all the data together, but now we're gonna use a more advanced, a more, uh, a more equitable concept of keeping the data locally at each country. But if you wanna work with all of the data, you can do specific queries to the database. You can ask the grid algorithm, the grid hub, for a specific pattern of data, and then it goes to the local databases and extract only the data that was required. So this way, data ownership is still is kept with each participating site. And then this um, algorithm, this hub, then provides a, an output, a data market, a data product that can be used to generate innovation, provide information, build dashboards, and feedback policy and clinical practice. The whole thing about this is the process of standardizing and this development using a fair principle is going to make this database a lot more reproducible, a lot more interoperable. So that's going to work with different systems and different developing systems and is going to be reusable further on from just being a quality evaluation project from a hospital in a low and income country out there. So this is a way of how you get the concept of data lifecycle and transports this back to developing a database. Sid developed a great work on this space on his thesis, congregating several different data sources in India and combining them into one database that now can be used to develop innovation from the healthcare policy perspective that I think is very interesting. This is kind of our most our newer framework for this project. Uh, so basically, the grid hub functions as this uh, connectivity between different sites, and we can use this information to build distributed learning health systems, do crowdsourcing, do dynamic data analysis, and make sure that the data that's now developed provide a lot more information back to the user than what the way it's been entailed before. So that's from the data uh, piece. Um, I have a question here. Does the data infrastructure in Brazil collect data from private healthcare systems as well? It does not. It's only public based. The difference from Brazil to other countries that I find very unique is that the Brazilian health system, given the way that the public healthcare policy is organized, covers about 70% of the population. So about, uh, it's, I think the last metric was 67 six, but around 70% of the population is uniquely covered only by the public health care system. So losing the private care system, we're losing about 30% of the population and is vastly known that this is the higher income population to which public health care policy might not necessarily be the target. So it, we, feel, we feel very strongly that the public health care data from Brazil is a very good diagnostic example from the healthcare situation 
in the population that mostly need healthcare support, public healthcare support. Yeah, it's very different from other models that are more private, public uh, driven. And there's other things that makes us think that the public data is enough because most hospitals in the country, there's very few hospitals that are uniquely private hospitals. Most hospitals have part public, part private, and then we can still understand healthcare access from that perspective as well, because the private infrastructure is available for the public for the uh, public setting as well. It's a very good question, yes. So jumping to model visualization, a lot of what we do is GIS. We do a lot of geographical re georeferencing and geo analysis. Uh, a couple of examples, this is a work we've done uh, with road traffic injury surveillance in Rwanda, Tanzania, and Sri Lanka. And basically what we did here is we took policy, police data on where health uh, crashes were happening. And by geolocating these crashes, we were able to identify hotspots and identifying hotspots using GIS to know where crashes were happening within roads, within a city, then we could structure a more detailed study to understand for each hotspot, what were the built environment characteristics from those hotspots to be able to understand what could be potential triggers for uh, road traffic injury and how we could inform policy on what to prioritize in uh, trying to address these issues. At this time, when we did this study many years ago, we did this manually, so people were there taking photos and we were tagging the photos ourselves. Now, what we're doing is we're using artificial intelligence to automatically tag the photos. We're getting photos from um, either uh, open uh, databases such as Google, or we're getting people to do the photos for us in places where this is a little bit more remote, but then we're pushing this through an interfacial artificial intelligence that can trigger what is missing at each location that are potential protection for road traffic injury. And then from that, we can feed back into an automated report that goes back to the uh, legislators and the policymakers in these municipalities and giving them proxies of areas where what kind of infrastructural uh, uh, development is needed in areas where you have hotspots for crashes. So it's a very interesting approach of GIS combined with artificial intelligence for image recognition. Another application of GIS in, again, in Brazil. So this is a map of Brazil um, and how Brazil is structured. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, this is where the Amazon forest is mostly located. And so uh, what we do here is using this large national databases we have in Brazil that tells us exactly where every hospital in the country is where, oops, where every hospital, I'm sorry, this is, my mouse is too sensible, yes. So where every hospital is located, for every hospital, we know how many beds are available, what's the healthcare personnel available, what are the procedures that are done in those hospitals, uh, then combining that with a database that has where people live and died for a given ICD code or where people that were hospitalized lived, we, we've been doing a lot of work trying to understand access to care. Uh, and this is an example of how we combine different data sources and using machine learning techniques to reduce these data sources into uh, dimensions such as principal component analysis and other clustering techniques. We created this uh, index of access to care that could help us understand which places in the country had uh, problematic access to care considering the surgical marker of two hours. And all of the red parts of the country here are places where the population is, there's a large portion of the population that are not within two hours of driving towards reaching a, health, a hospital. And this is very interesting because we were able to discuss this with the Ministry of Health in Brazil in thinking of how this information could help them uh, prepare campaigns to address COVID in the past year, which later they decided to ignore, but that's fine. Um, but again, leveraging data, when COVID hit, what we did is using the same data to try to understand what was the preparedness of the country 
in trying to address the COVID uh, pandemic and the potential uh, burden that it was going to cause. So this was an analysis we did. It's about to get published that we tried to understand what was the healthcare capacity available across the country to address COVID with the standards that were needed at the time. So what we did in all of these maps here is we looked at the availability of ICU beds per uh, uh, medical professional. So how many ICU beds you had per medical interventionist, per ICU nurse, per um, uh, ICU technology, uh, technician, and physical therapist to help provide support with uh, respiratory uh, care. And what we could see, the red spaces are spaces where the country were not properly staffed to deal with a crisis according to the Brazilian uh, legislation of what would, would be minimal requirements. The white spaces are spaces in the country where you had none. So you had zero ICU beds, you had zero uh, hospitals, and therefore you also had zero capacity. And as you can see clearly, as you go from south to north in Brazil, you see a lot of these white spaces. And the white spaces here are also spaces, all of these whites in the first place is where the Amazon forest is. And we have a lot of work that we're doing now just discussing that access to healthcare in these low resource or remote areas, it's just terrible because they have to cover rivers and all of that. Down here, we see the amount of hospital beds per physician, per nurse, per uh, nurse technician, and by physical therapist. And you can see that there's a shortage in nurses, especially in the north of the country. There's also a uh, uh, worst proportion of hospital beds by technicians in the white spaces, which is mostly in the center in the north. And there's just not enough physical therapists to provide support in ICU care. Um, and this was a diagnostic study that we did. Um, not a curiosity, the Amazon space in the country is where we had the worst pandemic hit problems in the country, which is something we would have expected. Another example of leveraging data science, now not just looking at data and data visualization, but now looking at developing models, is this project we use with preterm birth risk stratification. So one of the things they do in Brazil that I find very unique uh, is that this image here on top is called a, an intelligent map so that every basic health unit in the country that covers a, an area. So for instance, this green area here, this is the map of the municipality and the green area is an area that's covered by a basic health unit in this municipality. And so what they do is that they map out the entire neighborhood and oops, for every house in the neighborhood, they put pins or colors to mark houses that have somebody with a hypertension, somebody with diabetes, somebody that's a newborn, somebody with, with a list of the nine or 10 uh, targeted uh, healthcare, primary care sensitive conditions in the country. And they do this manually, which is pretty nice. It's a very beautiful work that people do with lack of technological experience. And so I got some funding early on in 2010, 2011, to make this automated. So we created the AutoMap, it's a, not a very creative name, uh, which basically what did is the healthcare professionals, so the basic health unit workers would enter the patient data into a system or we would just get this data from their system when the system was available. It would go through an interface that basically used R because that's what I could program at the time uh, in a database. And then it would spit out an automatic map this is, at that time, it was pretty unique. Now it's kind of something anybody can do with a little bit of our knowledge in a database. So uh, what we did is we created this and we implemented this at the location so that the form now in, the, in, in its earlier versions, it's just prettier, but basically you have the same evidence. You have the, the location of the neighborhood and then the points, basically for each point, you have a little bit of the patient uh, chart and the patient uh, diagnostic, if it was ever attributed one like that. Uh, but then what we did now is that we're getting this basic information, we're putting its steps forward. 
So what we're doing now is that we are integrating this knowledge of being able to geolocate the targeted area, the catchment area for a basic health unit. And by distributing the geolocation of what the targeted area should be, we can identify areas of gap in care. So for instance, in this municipality here in the north of Brazil, it's the municipality of Belém do Pará, uh, we could identify all of the gaps in access to primary care. And we are using this now to help the secretaries of health replan their healthcare policy. Because the healthcare policy in Brazil is organized in a way that the entirety of the municipality should be covered by a basic health unit. And we're helping them pinpoint where new basic health units need to be put so that it can be covered in its entirety. That's one thing. The other thing is we're also doing GIS studies, as you can see here to the right, to try to understand what is the association of socioeconomic status, the structure, sorry, oops, the structure of healthcare services and the dynamic processes of healthcare services that are conducted across the country to understand how these associate with poor outcomes. So these maps here are showing the association of socioeconomic status, structure of basic health units, and processes, so clinical processes done at basic health units, and how it's associated with uh, a poor birth outcome. So premature birth, neonatal mortality, or infant mortality, or maternal mortality. And what we can clearly see in these maps is that the best, so having more structure of primary health care is associated with uh, worst outcomes in the north of the country. And it's a, in socioeconomic status, so disparity in healthcare is associated with negative outcomes in some areas of the country that now, sorry, what we are doing is we're using this information to feedback this project that we're doing now, which is for these areas, we're using this data. So structure of healthcare, socioeconomic characteristics, maternal characteristics, and workforce or dynamic processes conducted to build an artificial intelligence that can help us uh, predict what is the potential outcome of a birth during prenatal care. So, and this is without the need for further diagnostic imaging or ultrasound or anything like that. We want the mother to come to a basic health unit, give a basic screening of healthcare habits, history, and location where they live with the amount of healthcare infrastructure available. And we using that, we're trying to predict uh, the estimated delivery date, risk for neonatal mortality, for maternal mortality, for preterm birth, uh, what's called a high preterm birth. So preterm birth below, uh, I think it's 32 weeks. I got to see what the marker is. And by using that, and by using that automated mapping technology, we are now giving this dashboard to the healthcare system, the policymakers, so they can build a monitoring tool, a monitoring system, and understand where the risks are increasing so they can do specific healthcare campaigns and try to reduce this outcome in that location. This project was funded by the Gates Foundation, and it's been very, very interesting to work. We've been uh, trying to bring this to Tanzania now because it was a very unique project. We're in the process of implementing this technology in a couple of municipalities for tests now. The same, the same GIS component of geolocating cases, we used it for uh, just developing micro planning campaigns. So what we're doing in this project now, funded by PAHO, that we're seeking further funding, is using that initial geolocating technology that I was talking about and incrementing that with artificial intelligence to build a database that has satellite imagery, secondary data from these countries, and geographic real-time dynamic visualization to provide a diagnostic tool for healthcare policy or healthcare campaigns needs in a given geographical scenario. So what we are doing is we're collecting data from their secondary data sources that are available on healthcare surveys or 
basic social demographics that are available in every country. We're combining that with satellite imagery to identify within a geographical space where people are located. And this is something that Sid is very versed on because he did on his thesis. So if you want to work with this, talk to Sid. He knows all about this technology. Uh, and basically what we're doing is we can provide an input so that for a big geographical space, we know where people are living because that's where buildings are. And we can identify that using land coverage by satellite imagery. And then we can impute the population from the large census data to that specific location. So now, instead of having the population targeted to a large geographical unit, I have it to smaller geographical units that now I can use to build better distance metrics, access metric, catchment area metric matrices. In Brazil, we did a study on this space and we identified, for instance, about a million people that did not have geographical access to a basic health unit. And we, we brought this back to the municipality to discuss that these areas were areas that were probably not gonna get people vaccinated because these people are not gonna reach vaccinating locations. And we need to bring the health campaign to this population. So it was a very interesting project to do. We're now in the process of expanding this project to other countries using available data. So this is an example of applying the same technology to Egypt and we've doing to other countries as well. So combining this uh, idea of secondary data, GIS, uh, and different data sources, building databases, you can build intelligence out of it, as I have shown you. A different approach, which is a totally different project that now uses the NLP we were talking about in the chat, is this project where we started this project in Swatini. We're doing this now in Brazil. And the main question here was, these countries have their uh, emergency care hotlines. So in Iswatini, it's called the 977. In Brazil, it's the, it's in the United States, it's the 911. So it's the hotline you call to request an ambulance. And although you're, you're establishing this in the country, it's harder, it's easier to buy ambulances than to train people to, to properly receive a call and monitor and stratify the risk. So what we were working with this group was to try to build a uh, system that could receive the call, the audio or the text of the call, and automatically derive what would be the main complaint of that call so that somebody with less training could have this system there to potentialize their ability to identify the call. We have a lot of data showing that in low and middle income countries with less structure for trained personnel, the errors in identifying the right reason for the call are high. And that improves, that brings a lot of delay in the process of care. So what we are doing here is that we are getting the text of these calls. And now in Brazil, we're getting the audio of these calls. We're doing a process of cleaning these audios. Then we're transcribing these audios or looking at the audio uh, uh, wavelength to be able to classify this. Uh, and there's a couple of processes in NLP, such as tokenization, where you break down the words into their tokens, and then you can analyze that word, uh, combining that with visualization to understand what are the main complaints of the calls. We're then using techniques. Initially, we were using latent semantic analysis. So whoever asked what are the models, uh, NLP models used to identify mental health disorders, Latent semantic analysis was one done. Uh, it, there's, there's actually a, a very uh, uh, cited paper on schizophrenia, trying to identify schizophrenia in Facebook text using latent semantic analysis. But there are better models now that are, uh, that are uh, based on deep learning or based on uh, applications such as uh, word to vec or um, there's a myriad of clustering techniques you can use to try to find uh, the best group of uh, information out of unstructured data. The difference here is if you're going to have a anchor to use supervised modeling, or if you're not going to have an anchor to use unsupervised modeling, and then choosing the best model you can use. Um, and then with that, create the categorization, right? So this figure here is what we call uh, a geography of words. And basically the words here are condensed together because they have similar meanings. 
according to our latest semantic approach. And then based on the clustering, you can identify their complaints, the reasons for complaints, right? In this study, we identified 21 different complaints that are now being validated. So a deep dive look into one of these uh, clusters is this cluster here, where you can see that there is labor, full term, discharge, primigravida, pregnant. And so this is a cluster of calls that are related to pregnancy related calls. And you can identify the meaning using similar approaches as this one. This is an example of our analytical approach. We are initially using an unsupervised learning approach to find the first clusters. And then choosing the best unsupervised approach, we use then another piece of the data to do a supervised uh, learning process and then getting a classification of this call. So a hybrid model that then will come up to a model where we're gonna have expert uh, give us feedback on how good this model is. Uh, yeah, so just a couple of examples of the categories we find. So road traffic injuries, respiratory problems, cardiovascular problems, gastrointestinal, diabetes. And now we are working on trying to find ways to identify triggers for each of these processes so that the user can ask point questions and then come up with a good diagnostics or a good, uh, uh, not diagnostics, but uh, complaint measure out of this. Uh, this is the a video depiction of the geography of words that I just find it pretty cool uh, to show. And this is my student in Portuguese. You don't have to listen to Portuguese, but uh, yeah. So the, that's all the modeling. Let me show you the, the network. So this is how the, the ge geography looks like. It's pretty nice. So basically every blue point there is a word and they are, their proximity is based on their similarity. And there's a bunch of different uh, ways to do so. He's doing principal component analysis. There's the uh, uh, vector approach here, the TSNE. There's the UMAP approach, which is a deep learning based. And then you can choose the to find the clusters and what they refer to, what are the similarities of the words. So yeah, this is just nerdy things geeking out, which is pretty nice. Yeah, uh, but these were a couple of the examples I wanted to give you. Uh, we have other types of work that we're doing uh, so far. And like I said, Sid has done an amazing job on this GIS policy application. We're doing a reinforcement learning for alcohol who use now on his project. So he could give you a full hour lecture just on the same topic if you guys want to listen to him. Uh, but I'm happy to come talk again in different topics of specific questions you might ask or areas you might want to learn a little bit more of the work we're doing. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Well, thanks, Joao. Uh, we can we can take up a few questions now. So if you have a question uh, on like any part of the presentation or anything else that you want to discuss, which is related to what Joao just presented, uh, go ahead and mute yourself and we can take a few questions. Uh, hi, hi, Joel. It's Atmika here. Nice, nice meeting you. Thanks for the presentation. It was amazing. Um, so, I ha so I have like two questions. Uh, one of which is, um, what is the scope of data science with respect to infectious diseases in low and middle income countries? And I'm not just talking about COVID, but I'm also talking about other types like neglected tropical diseases or something like that. So with respect to infectious diseases, where do you see data science coming in? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a pretty cool question. I see it coming in. Uh, let me try to frame it differently. I, I think that data science is going to be the main driver of how we look at data for everything, right? So if you're looking at data, because of the ability to integrate data with technology and methodological approaches, it's going to be what we do every day. Right. So uh, with that said, there is a lot of 
uh, applications that I find very unique. Uh, some of the coolest applications of, uh, of infectious disease that I found is for disease surveillance. So I'll give you two examples. Mm -hmm. There's a project that became very known, and I think it's a fascinating project, that uh, tracked people's interaction on Twitter and could pinpoint locations for uh, uh, outbreaks of flu, influenza, in a given country that I don't remember now, just by mapping out where people were tweeting from and if they were tweeting that they had flu symptoms. And you could identify outbreaks based on that. The other application that I found fascinating is a work that colleagues of here from DJGR are doing in the Amazon forest area, where they are mapping out uh, historical patterns of climate, of uh, forest use or deforestation, healthcare use, and trying to come up with patterns of when certain outbreaks are happening or what are potential environmental health topics that could help us understand outbreaks in given diseases. Uh, in, in the Brazil case, they are specifically looking at uh, dengue and uh, lead-based poisoning and some other stuff. So that is all pretty fascinating and I find it really, really nice. Uh, a simple application application that I see some colleagues in Brazil using that uh, is something that I find every country should have its own version is having the data infrastructure for healthcare complaints that in real time can look at time trends and observe time trends increase in given symptoms that could trigger outbreaks locally. That's how the Brazilian government identified Zika virus, for instance, when it reached Brazil that year. Uh, and we can, do, we can do that in real time now if we have good data collection mechanisms. We are using, uh, for instance, uh, social networks and healthcare utilization and social hubs, what we're calling social hubs, which is basically mapping out locations in a municipality where people go together, like football stadiums, bars, places where people conglomerate. And then we are pinpointing where people have tuberculosis and by social networking them with being in the same place in a, in a hub location or living close to a hub location, we're trying to identify social networks of potential targets for TB, tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And by that, trying to improve our capacity to do active monitoring, right? So there's a myriad of applications you can do in this space. Uh, and I'm not even talking about... Uh, uh, disease modeling, so modeling uh, distribution of diseases and outbreaks from that standpoint. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I find it all pretty cool. Okay, um, so another question, I mean, it's not per se about uh, data science, but um, so I'm a medical doctor and uh, like I am interested in data science. So what pathway would you suggest getting into data? What, what would you suggest starting from? Yeah, that's, that's, that's always a good question. So, uh, uh, all right, so you're a medical doctor. I imagine you're gonna have a field of expertise that you like, right? Infectious disease, whatever. So get very good at that field, like yeah. learn the clinical pathways and all of that. Uh, then I would suggest you start by learning how to code, okay? Choose a language, start taking code coding courses. I personally like working on projects to learn because then I have a task to fulfill but learn how to code first. Uh, there's the, the, the amount of library online for you to learn how to code is just ridiculously high. But I think that partnering with groups that are doing this process actively will help you because you're going to have people to help you debug in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Learning how to code is usually a very steep curve in the beginning. And then it goes really fast. Once you pass the first time of understanding what the hell I'm doing trying to talk to this machine, the next step is really, really fast. So learning how to code, and I would suggest you learn how to code either in Python or in R, because those are the two biggest data science languages out there. 
there's going to be people arguing up to you for you to learn how to code in other sources. I would suggest these two because these two languages are languages that have a lot of people actively deploying both statistical analysis codes and computer science based uh, questions codes. So learn how to program in one of them. Uh, and you can learn how to program that by doing research, by doing projects. So it's meaningful to you in your clinical practice. And then once you're in a stage where you know enough how to code so you can handle yourself around doing a project or another, then choose one of the other two areas. And I would suggest because you're a clinician, choose statistics and go learn that in more detail. That's the pathway that I would suggest. How do you do that in practice? I personally like courses, so I would suggest take your master's, take a master's in a field. If you can take a master's in data science, even better. Otherwise, do online courses that you can start learning, but get engaged with a group that does this kind of techniques because you are going to have tasks to perform that will help you learn. You're going to have projects that will give you something back while you're learning. You're going to publish papers. You're going to be involved in products. And you're going to have a cohort of peers that are on the same process as you are that you can tag along and help you through your process. So that's what I would suggest. I would not suggest you go learn statistics first because the, the, the curve for understanding statistics enough for you to then start coding is a little steeper than the curve for learning how to code. And I, I would suggest that once you know how to code models, then you go back and you start learning the basics is necessary, but you're going to you're going to be able to apply that in practice or do the exercises without the abstract learning of uh, matrices or algebra and all of that. That would be my suggestion. That makes sense. That's quite helpful. Thanks, all. Uh, sure. Do we, we have any other questions? Uh, please unmute yourself and go ahead. I don't see any in the chat box. Yeah, I got some pretty cool questions in the chat box. Chat box um, the I think Joe, we missed one by uh, Vinayak. He's asked, can you please tell me which model of NLP was used to identify mental health disorders from the user's uh, social media post? I, I think we missed that one. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I talked a little bit about this when I was talking about NLP. Uh, they, the, the paper that I referred to that looked into schizophrenia from uh, Facebook posts used uh, latent semantic models, so latent semantic analysis. We are using now, I'm, I'm missing the name of the model we're using in our chief complaint project, but uh, basically it's a mixture of clustering techniques with deep learning. Uh, there's a specific name for it, but the ones that I've, I've seen using for mental health were latent semantic analysis models that are pretty interesting. Yeah, because it really depends on what you're applying it to, right? So the chatbot uh, project is less interested on diagnosing the disease and interested on replying to your questions. So then you use a simpler model because it's just triggering the question and giving you back a response. The one that uh, uses uh, trying to understand mental health, then it tries to find the meaning of the words uh, and latent semantic was what it did. Latent semantic basically gets all the sentences together and based on the words they use and the similarity of the words they use, they weight those sentences together and attribute a latent trait to those, meaning they have somebody something that predicts people saying those words. And that's what a, a latent semantic analysis is. I see that uh, uh, Vinayak, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, uh, said uh, you use sentiment analysis before, which is, a, I, I love sentiment analysis, yes. I specifically like sentiment analysis where you, when you build your sentiment library and then you use that to tag the system. So it, it's not just necessarily about positive and negative valence, but you can also build a system to tag your words based on some sort of theoretical concept, which is basically what we're doing with the chief complaints model. Yeah. Yeah, no, those, those are pretty cool. 
questions. I appreciate that. Okay. If there are no more questions, I think we have already like run out of time. Uh, and we should we should let Joel have his lunch and enjoy his yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sid. Well, I appreciate again the time and opportunity and feel free to get in touch with our group. Uh, happy to talk more. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joel. Bye. Bye. Right. Thanks everyone for joining in.